Section 24 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Bennett. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 6, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 24. A man-hating maiden. The ever-worthy and famous King Vakramaditya had a painter named Nagarasvamin, who enjoyed the revenues of a hundred villages, and surpassed Visvakarman. That painter used every two or three days to paint a picture of a girl, and give it as a present to the king, taking care to exemplify different types of beauty. Now, once on a time, it happened that the painter had, because a feast was going on, forgotten to paint the required girl for the king. And when the day for giving the present arrived, the painter remembered and was bewildered, saying to himself, Alas, what can I give to the king? And at that moment a traveller come from afar suddenly approached him and placed a book in his hand and went off somewhere quickly. The painter, out of curiosity, opened the book and saw within a picture of a girl on canvas. Inasmuch as the girl was of wonderful beauty, no sooner did he see her picture than he took it and gave it to the king, rejoicing that, so far from having no picture to present that day, he had obtained such an exceedingly beautiful one. But the king, as soon as he saw it, was astonished, and said to him, My good fellow, this is not your painting. This is the painting of Visvakarman. For how could a mere mortal be skillful enough to paint such beauty? When the painter heard this, he told the king exactly what had taken place. Then the king kept ever looking at the picture of the girl, and never took his eyes off it and one night he saw in a dream a girl exactly like her, but in another land. But as he eagerly rushed to embrace her, who was eager to meet him, the night came to an end, and he was woke up by the watchman. When the king awoke, he was so angry at the interruption of his delightful interview with that maiden that he banished that watchman from the city. And he said to himself, To think that a traveller should bring a book, and that in it there should be the painted figure of a girl, and that I should in a dream behold this same girl apparently alive. All this elaborate dispensation of destiny makes me think that she must be a real maiden, but I do not know in what land she lives, how am I to obtain her? Full of such reflections, the king took pleasure in nothing, and burned with the fever of love so that his attendants were full of anxiety, and the warder, Badrayuda, asked the afflicted king in private the cause of his grief, whereupon he spoke as follows. Listen, I will tell you, my friend. So much at any rate you know, that that a painter gave me the picture of a girl, and I fell asleep thinking on her, and I remember that in my dream I crossed the sea, and reached and entered a very beautiful city. There I saw many armed maidens in front of me, and they, as soon as they saw me, raised a tumultuous cry of kill, kill. Then a certain female ascetic came, and with great precipitation made me enter her house, and briefly said to me this, My son, here is the man-hating princess Malayavati come this way, diverting herself as she pleases, and the moment she sees a man, she makes these maidens of hers kill him, so I brought you in here to save your life. When the female ascetic had said this, she immediately made me put on female attire, and I submitted to that, knowing that it was not lawful to slay those maidens. But when the princess entered into the house with her maidens, I looked at her, and lo, she was the very lady that had been shown me in a picture. And I said to myself, Fortunate am I in that after first seeing this lady in a picture, I now behold her again in flesh and blood, dear as my life. In the meanwhile the princess, at the head of her maidens, said to that female ascetic, We saw some male enter here. The ascetic showed me, and answered, I know of no male. Here is my sister's daughter, who is with me as a guest. Then the princess, seeing me, 
although I was disguised as a woman, forgot her dislike of men and was at once overcome by love. She remained for a moment, with every hair on her body erect, motionless as if in thought, being, so to speak, nailed to the spot at once with arrows by love, who had spied his opportunity. And in a moment the princess said to the ascetic, Then, noble lady, why should not your sister's daughter be my guest also? Let her come to my palace. I will send her back duly honored. Saying this, she took me by the hand and led me away to her palace. And I remember, I discerned her intention, and consented, and went there, and that sly old female ascetic gave me leave to depart. Then I remained there with that princess, who was diverting herself with the amusement of marrying her maidens to one another, and so forth. Her eyes were fixed on me, and she would not let me out of her sight for an instant, and no occupation pleased her in which I did not take part. Then those maidens, I remember, made the princess a bride, and me her husband, and married us in sport. And when we had been married, we entered at night the bridal chamber, and the princess fearlessly threw her arms round my neck. And then I told her who I was, and embraced her, and delighted at having attained her object, she looked at me, and then remained a long time with her eyes bashfully fixed on the ground. And at that moment that villain of a watchman woke me up. So, Badrayuda, the upshot of the whole matter is that I can no longer live without that Malayavati, whom I have seen in a picture and in a dream. When the king said this, the warder, Badrayuda, perceived that it was a true dream, and he consoled the monarch, and said to him, If the king remembers it all exactly, let him draw that city on a piece of canvas in order that some expedient may be devised in this matter. The moment the king heard this suggestion of Badrayuda's, he proceeded to draw that splendid city on a piece of canvas, and all the scene that took place there. Then the warder at once took the drawing, and had a new monastery made, and hung it up there on the wall. And he directed that in relief houses attached to the monastery, a quantity of food, with pairs of garments and gold, should be given to bards coming from distant countries. And he gave this order to the dwellers in the monastery, If any one comes here, who knows the city represented here in a picture, let me be informed of it. In the meanwhile, the fierce elephant of the rainy season, with irresistible loud deep thunder roar and long kataka tusks, came down upon the forest of the heats, a forest the breezes of which were scented with the perfume of the jasmine, in which travellers sat down on the ground in the shade, and trumpet flowers bloomed. At that time the forest fire of separation of that king Vakramaditya began to burn more fiercely, fanned by the eastern breeze. Then the following cries were heard among the ladies of his court. Haralata, bring ice. Chitrangi, sprinkle him with sandalwood juice. Patraleka, make a bed cool with lotus leaves. Kandarpasena, fan him with plantain leaves. And in course of time the cloudy season terrible with lightning passed away for that king, but the fever of love burning with the sorrow of separation did not pass away. Then the autumn, with her open lotus face and smile of unclosed flowers, came, vocal with the cries of swans, seeming to utter this command. Let travellers advance on their journey. Let pleasant tidings be brought about absent dear ones. Happy may their merry meetings be. On a certain day in that season a bard, who had come from a distance, of the name of San Veracidi, having heard the fame of that monastery built by the warder, entered it to get food. After he had been fed, and presented with a pair of garments, he saw that painting on the wall of the monastery. When the bard had carefully scanned the city delineated there, he was astonished, and said, I wonder who can have drawn this city, for I alone have seen it, I am certain, and no other, and here it is drawn by some second person. When the inhabitants of the monastery heard that, they told Badrayuda. Then he came in person and took that bard to the king. The king said to San Veracidi, Have you really seen that city? Then San Veracidi gave him the following answer. When I was wandering about the world, I crossed the sea that separates the isles, 
and beheld that great city Malayapura. In that city there dwells a king of the name of Malayasinha, and he has a matchless daughter named Malayavati, who used to abhor males. But one night she somehow or other saw in a dream a great hero in a convent. The moment she saw him, that evil spirit of detestation of the male sex fled from her mind as if terrified. Then she took him to her palace, and in her dream married him, and entered with him the bridal chamber. And at that moment the night came to an end, and an attendant in her room woke her up. Then she banished that servant in her anger, and thinking upon that dear one whom she had seen in her dream, seeing no way of escape owing to the blazing fire of separation, utterly overpowered by love, she never rose from her couch except to fall back upon it again with relaxed limbs. She was dumb, as if possessed by a demon, as if stunned by a blow, for when her attendants questioned her she gave them no answer. Then her father and mother came to hear of it, and questioned her, and at last she was, with exceeding difficulty, persuaded to tell them what happened to her in the dream by the mouth of a confidential female friend. Then her father comforted her, but she made a solemn vow that if she did not obtain her beloved in six months she would enter the fire. And already five months are past. Who knows what will become of her? This is the story that I heard about her in that city. When San Varasiddhi had told this story, which tallied so well with the king's own dream, the king was pleased at knowing the certainty of the matter, and Badrayuda said to him, the business is as good as effected, for that king and his country own your paramount supremacy. So let us go there before the sixth month has passed away. When the warder had said this, King Vakramaditya made him inform Sanvarasiddhi of all the circumstances connected with the matter, and honored him with a present of much wealth, and bade him show him the way, and then he seemed to bequeath his own burning heat to the rays of the sun, his paleness to the clouds and his thinness to the waters of the rivers, and having become free from sorrow, set out at once, escorted by a small force, for the dwelling-place of his beloved. In course of time, as he advanced, he crossed the sea, and reached that city, and there he saw the people in front of it engaged in loud lamentation, and when he questioned them he received this answer, The Princess Malayavati is here, as the period of six months is at an end, and she has not obtained her beloved, is preparing to enter the fire. Then the king went to the place where the pyre had been made ready. When the people saw him they made way for him, and then the princess beheld that unexpected nectar rain to her eyes. And she said to her ladies-in-waiting, Here is that beloved come who married me in a dream, so tell my father quickly. They went and told this to her father, and then that king, delivered from his grief and filled with joy, submissively approached the sovereign. At that moment the bard Sanvarasiddhi, who knew his time, lifted up his arm and chanted aloud this strain, Hail thou that with the flame of thy valor hast consumed the forest of the army of demons and Malekas. Hail king, lord of the seven sea-girt earth bride! Hail thou that hast imposed thy exceedingly heavy yoke on the bowed heads of all kings conquered by thee! Hail Vishamasila! Hail, Vikramaditya, ocean of valor! When the bard said this, King Malayasinha knew that it was Vikramaditya himself that had come, and embraced his feet. And after he had welcomed him, he entered his palace with him, and his daughter Malayavati thus delivered from death. And that king gave that daughter of his to King Vikramaditya, thinking himself fortunate in having obtained such a son-in-law. And King Vikramaditya, when he saw in his arms, in flesh and blood, that Malayavati, whom he had previously seen in a picture and in a dream, considered it a wonderful fruit of the wishing tree of Siva's favor. Then Vikramaditya took with him his wife Malayavati, like an incarnation of bliss, and crossed the sea, resembling his long regretful separation, and being submissively waited upon at every step by kings, with various presents in their hands, returned to his own city, Ujjayini, and on beholding there that might of his, that satisfied freely every kind of curiosity. What people were not astonished? What people did not rejoice? What people did not make high festival? 
End of section 24.